Oh my goodness. This is really, thank you so much. It's just so wonderful to see so many of you here for what I know is gonna be like a B minus evening. I, know, I just know in advance. I know in advance, once you get to know Andrew, it's not that big of a deal. But uh, on the page, he's impressive, but you know. Um, it, I am honestly so, uh, so thrilled to see so many of you here and so thrilled to be rebooting this thing that we call Socrates in the City. Some of you were here uh, in May. What, how many of you were here in May when we had Apollo 16 astronaut Charlie Duke? Yeah. Yeah, that was a joke. He was never here. <laughs> you, why did you raise your hands? No, we, um, Socrates in the City is hard for me to explain, so I always have to try to explain it a little bit to say that uh, Socrates famously said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Uh, and so about 20-something years ago, some friends of mine and I got the idea that, you know, New Yorkers lead particularly unexamined lives. Uh, and I'm talking about you. Yes, I'm talking about you. Uh, you're shallow people, and, uh, and you need, we need to learn you some stuff. So, so I said, wouldn't it be great if we could have an event where we could have conversations with uh, thoughtful people, writers who can actually communicate verbally and have a conversation and talk about you know, the big questions in life, what we sometimes call life, God, and other small topics, you know, the big stuff that you're not supposed to talk about in, uh, at cocktail parties with your shallow friends. And, uh, and so we've been, we've been getting away with it uh, all this time. So, um, but it's, it, it varies dramatically. I mean, we've, we've had every kind of uh, uh, person here. Last time we really did have Apollo 16 astronaut Charlie Duke. And I thought, you know, just to mix it up, uh, in September we should have someone who has not walked on the moon. Uh, and there's about seven billion people on the planet. And I think there are only four people living who've walked on the moon. So pretty much anybody could have been the guest uh, today. So we really lucked out in, in getting Andrew. But at its heart, Socrates in the City, and not everybody will know this, but at its heart, Socrates in the City has always been a UFO cult. And I say that, I don't want to make you nervous, but at some point during one of these events, I won't say which event, the mothership will arrive. Uh, we will get on it. We will be wearing silver unitards, and I just know this in advance because I've seen the unitards. And, uh, and we're going we're gonna to gather. And what you wouldn't know either that over the years, um, as we've done these events, and we've had just an astonishing array of guests. If you look at the website, I, I still can't believe uh, some of the names we've gotten. But it's always just been something that I asked the guests that I interview uh, if they wouldn't mind, since we're a UFO cult, if they wouldn't mind shaving their heads. Um, <laughs> and you know what? I don't care. Listen, I don't care if they're gonna. You want to put on a wig uh, after you shave your head, okay? And most of them elected to do that. And if you look at the videos, you can see very clearly they're all wearing wigs. Um, <laughs> But Clavin uh, says, you know what? I don't care. What do, what do I care? Like, I've been married a million years. Like, I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll shave my head. And, and he's elected, and it's astonishing, but it's the first time in 22 years that he's not wearing the wig that most people would have elected to wear. And I just want to say, how about a round of applause? Because that's a big deal. I mean, to show up. I'm just saying to show up clean shaven like that takes a lot of moxie and it's never happened before. I just want to say kudos to you. All right, so it's a crisp fall day in New York, right? Pretty good. Uh, and um, I, I want to recognize there's some special guests here. There are many special guests here, but uh, is Dick Morris in the crowd? Where did he go? Dick Morris is here. This guy uh, is here. It's, uh, I don't want you to confuse him with the Dick Morris, okay? But he's, it's Dick Morris, his name's Dick Morris. Um, we've, got, we've got a number of special people here. I know that there, there's a, a, a group from Columbia University. Is that, oh, they're there. They're there, welcome, welcome. Uh, is that still in the Ivy League, or are you, how you doing? You still hanging in there? You are still hanging in. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful to see you here. A couple of club rules before I introduce uh, the guests. This is an old club, uh, and they always ask me to say this stuff. Uh, no, uh, in, this, is, uh, this is for the common rooms, in case you're making your way out of here. Uh, no leapfrog. 
Okay, I know we, I know we got a, a, a lot of big leapfrog aficionados in the group. Just, you know, wait till you get home. Uh, no Indian leg wrestling and no slap fights. In the, um, always in the VIP reception, you know. These people, they spend a couple extra bucks, they think they can do what they want. So we had some nasty stuff happen in the VIP reception. And we're gonna let it go this time, but uh, normally uh, we, we wouldn't let it go. So I just want you to know that. Uh, and thank you in advance for no slap fighting. Part of the reason we do Socrates in the City uh, is it seems very pointed to me at this time that we like to ask the big questions because I have this crazy idea that there are some good answers to the big questions. That it's not bleak and hopeless and we need to provide a forum where we can talk about that kind of stuff. And I think that uh, in the crazy times in which we live, a little hope uh, wouldn't be a bad thing. That could just be me. But I think having a little hope, a little understanding that, yeah, Maybe, uh, maybe we have reason uh, to hope. So tonight, Andrew and I will be talking about that a little bit. Now, in case you don't know anything about Andrew Clavin, he's the bald guy here. And um, Andrew is one of these people, he's tough to sum up. He has something called the Andrew Clavin Show at the Daily Wire podcast, which is, uh, uh, some of you are very familiar with that. But he's most known as an author, as a writer. And I have to say, it's very rare that I have someone here who is a writer n known for, how do I put this, for his writing, in the sense that a lot of people have a lot of great ideas and they put it into a book. But uh, to be uh, a great writer, an accomplished, a literary writer, uh, we had Mark Helprin here a few years ago who is just at the top of the top, just an amazingly gifted literary writer. Uh, I always aspire to that uh, in my books, but Andrew, uh, really is that. Uh, he, uh, in the book we're going to be talking about tonight, The Truth and Beauty, um, he, he writes so beautifully that uh, it's not just the ideas that are captivating, but it's the, the writing itself. And I, I want to say that because, again, as somebody who uh, aspires to that, it's not easy to do. Um, and uh, he does it very well. Now, I have never been a reader of mystery, mystery books or thrillers, but if you are, you're familiar with the Edgar Awards. Anybody here hear of the Edgar Awards? Some of you. Um, they're named, I think, uh, I think they're named after uh, Joan Rivers' husband was Edgar. <laughs> Wasn't it? Isn't that right? I'm pretty sure it's, it's her husband. He killed himself. His name was Edgar. I'm pretty sure that's what, that's what that is. Uh, or I don't know. I don't know. In any event, uh, or they, they, maybe they're named after Edgar Allan Poe. You remember the cheerful Edgar Allan Poe? <laughs> my, I gotta say, my favorite Edgar Allan Poe poem. Anybody familiar with The Conqueror Worm? Of course you are, right? Oh my gosh, I wish we could read that tonight, but we don't have time. Um, but honestly, to win the Edgar Award in the world of thrillers and mystery, whatever, just to give an example of who's won the award, Raymond Chandler, John le Carré, Michael Crichton, Dick Francis, Tony Hillerman, Ken Follett, Elmore Leonard, Stephen King nominated five times for the award and won it twice, Andrew Clavin. Yeah. All right. Yeah, now you're gonna show him some respect, right? Um, I wanna say he's also written screenplays uh, for big deal movies directed by people like Clint Eastwood and starring Michael Douglas and on and on and on. Um, the book we're going to be discussing principally tonight is called The Truth and Beauty. Um, when I heard the thesis of this book, I was astonished that anybody would try to pull off what Andrew tries to pull off and pulls off gloriously. Uh, it's, uh, the subtitle is How the Lives and Works of England's Greatest Poets Point the Way to a Deeper Understanding of the Words of Jesus. Who in the world, maybe literally no one except Andrew Clavin, would even think of this idea and then pull it off gloriously. Um, I want to read on the, the back of the book, there's some uh, blurbs. Stephen Meyer says, it's a stunningly original work, fascinating and informative. Not since reading C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce in College has a single book induced such deep and constructive theological reflection in me as I suspect it will for many other readers. Now, as you know, Stephen Meyer has been my guest here at Socrates in the City many times. And when you get to know him personally, he's really not that bright. Uh, he's, uh, he's kind of a jerk, to be honest, but, but the point is he's dead on in this endorsement, and I have to say uh, Jordan Peterson 
what a jackass that guy is. He's a, <laughs> that's not true. I just met him. He's another one of these ultra geniuses. Uh, he also raves about this book. There's no question, folks, that this is an amazing book and that it's an honor to have Andrew Clavin as my guest at Socrates and City. Please put it together for Andrew Clavin. Andrew, come join us. Bless you. Come on up. Wow, wow. Huh? It can only go downhill from here, you realize. It. Not, it's not many rooms where you can land a joke about Joan Rivers' husband. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Is it too soon? Is it too soon? Uh, Ed, Ed, Edgar's been gone a long time. Um, I meant it when I, everything I said, obviously, um, I meant about your work. Uh, it's astonishing. The, the thesis of the book, I said this to you, I interviewed you on my, on my radio program in front of a much more distinguished audience than these idiots. <laughs> but, but I have to tell you that the thesis of it, as someone who's an English major at Yale University and aspires to write, when I read the thesis, I thought, how, how could you even conceive of this idea. So I think I want to start there and ask you, how, how did this occur to you? Yeah. You know, because first of all, you know, there are many people here who haven't yet read the book. And this is the kind of book that bears rereading, and I mean that very sincerely. It's magnificent. But yes, how did you get the, get the, get the concept? Well, it is. I will, I will say that while I was writing it, while I had the dual experience on the one hand of feeling that I was standing on the laser dot of where God wanted me to be, like in one of those cop shows, those Dick Wolf shows, where they point the laser. I thought, I'm exactly where I should be. No one will ever buy this book. And I thought I, thought I was going to publish it myself. I, you know, I, I knew there was one editor uh, who might have the kind of scope where he would even at least listen to the idea. Uh, and he did, and he made it very clear to me he was doing it because he supported the book, but we weren't going to sell any copies. Uh, the, the book ended up on the USA Today bestseller list, and it's gotten really uh, good reviews. So, so you made a monkey of that the editor. The entire experience has been <laughs> absolutely wild. But it started with, uh, with a conversation I had with my son, who is a, a brilliant young man, uh, a, a doctor in, a, a, in classics from Oxford, uh, and we were talking about the Gospels one New Year's Eve. And the Gospels have, you know, when I, I came to Christ very late uh, in life, I was 49, and, um, and it tr transformed my life, as you would expect, and it made it uh, very joyful, and every time I understood the Gospels better, I became more joyful, which seemed like a good deal. <laughs> and yet I found that I had kind of hit a stumbling block, and that many of the things that Jesus said didn't make all that much sense to me, especially the Sermon on the Mount, with its idea that you know, things are bad now, but one day it's going to be great. You know, this kind of idea that life didn't, almost life didn't matter. You know, you suffer in life, but don't worry about it. It's going to get better later on. And I thought, no, that's not the way I feel about life. I feel life is essential. Uh, and my son turned to me and he said, you know, I think the problem is that you're trying to understand a philosophy instead of trying to get to know a person. And, and the minute he said that, I thought, that's, that's a really, I hate this kid. This is a really... <laughs> Smart, smart thing to say because, you know, I, I've been married for 42 years. I adore my wife and I know her very well. But if you ask me what her philosophy of life is, I'm not sure I'd be able to tell you. But if you ask me, would she like this movie? Or would she laugh at this joke? Or, you know, would she like this person? I would know. And I thought, you know, to know someone is to see through his eyes a little bit. Your friends, the people you love, you start to see through their eyes. So I, I put this project to myself. I taught myself uh, Greek badly, uh, but I did teach myself Greek. Well, hold on. <laughs> he tries to pass that off as almost normal, right? <laughs> it's like I'm offended that you even tried to pass it off as almost normal. I was raised in a home by a Greek father. I, I cannot really read Greek very effectively. So when you say that you taught yourself to read Greek, let me just say, that's impressive. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I want to, before you really get into this more, there's a previous question, because the thesis of the book is the main subject of the conversation. But you know, you, uh, you've been a very successful, brilliant writer for many, many years. And uh, you, you say that you came to faith late in life. I remember when you wrote your book on that subject called The Great Good Thing, which I know there are copies of it here. But I was similarly astonished 
by that book as I am by this book, because it's a crazy, I mean, it's different, but it's a genuinely crazy, amazing story. I mean, there's, I'm not exaggerating, you know that. Yeah, it's it. a wild story, yeah. So before we get to, uh, to the meat of this, could you share a little bit about how it is that you came to, to faith? I mean, to be a, a secular Jew growing up in New York, talking about Jesus, that's not normal. No, no. And uh, I'm not sure that I like it, but we're going to let it go. We're going to let it go. We're going to let it go. These people have showed up. We're going we're to go with it. But um, it, no, it's just kind of an amazing journey. And, I, and it really uh, explains a little bit, at least, how you uh, came to write this book. So w would you share a little bit of that uh, story, just so people have some context? Yeah, it was about as long a journey as you could possibly take. Uh, you know, I sometimes say a lot of people are born into their faith, but I was dropped into the desert with a paperclip and a piece of string and had to sort of find my way. Uh, I was raised in a, in a Jewish household. Uh, we were sent to Hebrew school. We were bar mitzvahed, but my parents didn't really believe in God. And um, my, my mother was the most convicted atheist I have ever met to the day she died. The most convicted? I, I don't think I've ever met anybody who cared less about, uh, about whether there were, even whether there was a God. She was just, all that hooey, she used to call it, all that hooey. Um, and my father was more of a kind of like, he didn't want to insult God because God can, you know, just think and you get cancer and he didn't want any of that. But like, you know, it, it, you forget, you know, you forget how mean God can be. True. <laughs> yeah. How just, petty. Just how like petty he can one, be. One slip. He's giving cancer. Yeah, you screw up. You're not giving cancer. Wow. Okay. Okay. So I grew up in a house where God wasn't present. You know, we didn't pray. We didn't talk about what God wanted out of your life or anything like that. But we learned all this Jewish stuff, and this Jewish stuff, empty of God, began to seem to me like an empty place. It seemed to me like a, the ruin of a beautiful building, not because of the religion, but because of the way I was being raised. And so when I, by the time I was bar mitzvahed, I very much felt like a, a complete hypocrite. And in fact, um, I ad-libbed my way through part of my bar mitzvah because I didn't, couldn't read the Hebrew, so I was just making up words. And, um, <laughs> and you I know, it's, it's true. <laughs> And, you know, I got a lot of um, guilt, a lot of gifts. I grew up in a, a fairly well-to-do neighborhood, and I got a lot of, uh, you know, watches and savings bonds and all this stuff. And I was very proud of it. It was the first time I was 13 years old, the first time I ever had any wealth. And over the course of about six months, I started to think, you know, this is ill-gotten gains because I lied for it, and I knew I was lying. And I did it because I had to. My father forced me to do it. I didn't want to do it. And... One night, I waited till everybody was asleep, and I crept outside with this leather box full of thousands of dollars worth of bar mitzvah gifts, and I stuffed it into the trash, that way down deep so nobody would find it. Um, and I thought, that's it. I'm done with religion. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not so much that I was done with God. I was just done with any kind of organized thinking about it, and ultimately, I just became what my cohort was. I was a... I, I, was an intellectual type in, a, in the arts. Uh, I lived on the coast. You know, I lived in the New York coast, California. I lived in London. I was what everybody was, was basically an atheist, an agnostic in philosophy maybe, but in fact, in practice, an atheist. And over time, this philosophy simply started to not make sense to me. It did not make sense to me that you could have a moral world. And I was certain after reading Dostoevsky that there was a moral world, that the relativism that was coming up through the academic ranks didn't make any sense. But I couldn't put it together and I couldn't break out of my cohort. I couldn't break out of the narrative of the culture I was in. And just as I was beginning to realize that this didn't make sense, I had, I went nuts. I went nuts. I, I won't call it a nervous breakdown. I went insane. How old were you? I was in my late 20s. I was about 28. And what had you been doing up to that point? I, was, I had been a newspaper man. I had uh, published a novel that had failed utterly. Uh, I had written a crazy novel about Jesus because by then I realized Jesus was at the center of Western culture. So I was interested in him as a figure, but totally from a secular point of view. I was explaining Jesus to myself. And um, I, I went... I mean, I was I had delusions, I had crippling hypochondria, I couldn't move, I couldn't make a living, I couldn't do anything. Now, you, you mentioned in the book, I think I remember, your father was a pretty famous media figure. He was a famous New York DJ, yeah. He was like, before there was Rush and before there were national DJs, he was as famous as you got as a DJ. 
uh, and we had a very difficult relationship. Uh, he had told me, he caught me reading uh, the Gospel according to Luke when I was 15, which I was reading purely because I wanted to be a writer, so I wanted to know what the center of Western literature was, and he was furious, which always makes me laugh because I was 15. I could have been reading a lot of other things. Um, it was, it, I mean, it was, it was, it was the, the 60s, uh, and I was sexually active, so he literally could have walked uh, in... Uh, you know. <laughs> But he walked in, and I was reading the Gospel according to Luke, and he was furious. I mean, he was just absolutely, you know. I you should have hit it like in a Playboy or something. I should have hit it. <laughs> That's the thing. That's I should acceptable. Have buried, I should have buried That's it under acceptable. the girl, right? Just <laughs> could you lie on the, on the box? And he told me, he said, if you ever, he was screaming at me with his finger in my face. He said, if you ever think of converting, I will disown you. So, so we had a really difficult relationship, which was at the heart of a lot of my psychological problems. But when I went mad, and I am now to absolutely convinced this was a literal miracle because I've never met anybody who went so mad and so sane, uh, I found a psychiatrist, a, a secular Jew, uh, who was a brilliant guy, and he was kind of a neo-Freudian, I wouldn't say he was a Freudian, and I went sane. And while I was in this depression, that suicidal depression, even though I had started to think that God might be real, I, was, I couldn't accept God because I was in so much pain. I thought, well, if you accept God when you're in this much pain, it's just a crutch. So it's, how would you ever know it was real? It was like if those guys who take you know, drugs, ayahuasca or something like this, and they see God, well, I could take a drug and see Mickey Mouse. You know, that wouldn't be very uh, convincing. And that, that's the way I felt about grabbing this uh, driftwood of God while I was sinking under this depression. But this guy cured me, uh, and it was miraculous. And the two things about the cure... I'm just amazed that a, a neo-Freudian had any success. Well, this is the thing. This is the thing. <laughs> After I, I was cured, I realized that everything we had talked about was nonsense. That Freud was, you know, Freud, I, I'm going to say Freud was, a, Freud was a brilliant quack, but he was still a quack, you know. And, and none of this stuff... And I, I thought, well, what was it that cured me? And it was that I loved him. He was my, the only mentor I've ever had in my life. And it was the love between us. And in fact, this love uh, that I have for um, my wife, your mom, uh, that has, has been a, a remarkable romance that I have gone through for 42 years, uh, a marriage literally in which we have had one five-minute argument 35 years ago. My uh, next wife is going to be different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Mine too. I'm sorry, honey, yeah. by that so. <laughs> And, and this idea of love started to bring me back to the idea that the, the, the world had a, a moral underpinning, it, that there was a moral meaning to life, and, a, and a, that it was connect, our life was connected to this meaning through love. And I started to pray, and prayer transformed my life yet again in this truly dramatic way. And after about five years of prayer, and now I'm 49 years old, I mean, it's taken, it's, you know, I, I, I sometimes say to God, you know, I know I'm a Jew, but why did you let me wander for 40 years? Before? <laughs> I, I think that is why, yeah. I think that's why. But, but after about five years, I was now, if I may say so, a successful and awarded novelist. I was writing screenplays in California, <laughs> driving around in the BMW convertible in the hills of Santa Barbara. You're a cliche. I, I'm a cliche, yeah. yeah. And I'm talking to God, and I'm saying to him, you know, <laughs> you've, you've transformed my life, not, not the BMW, just actually in here, you know, you've transformed. What, what can I do for you? Because you're God and I'm a schmo, you know? And, and it was almost as if he said to me, you know, you should be baptized. I, I, it, I didn't hear a voice, but it was that solid. It was that instantaneous. And I'm driving along, and I said, you got to be kidding me, you know, out loud, you know? Because what did I need that for? I mean, I, I kind of made sort of peace with my father. He was a good, wonderful grandfather. Where the family was getting along. I thought, this would blow up my family. I'm working in Hollywood. My career will be over. You know, it'd be just a, a, an absolute disaster. And so for five months, like W.C. Fields reading the Bible, I was looking for a, a loophole, you know, and I... <laughs> And the, and the more I thought about it... The, uh, the young people don't understand what you mean <laughs> hey, if they by W.C. Fields. If they, got the, if they got the Joan Rivers Yeah, joke, they didn't I, get that either, but, who, but, I, but I don't care. I figure you would care. Um, yeah. But, but after five months of absolute tortured reflection, 
Because on top of everything else, I mean, there has been a lot of a history of anti-Semitism in the church, and I was wrestling with that as well. Uh, how was it, wasn't I joining the other team? You know, wasn't I joining the bad guys? Um, <laughs> but after five months, I realized, no, this was the real deal. I mean, There's no question about it. And uh, in, in a sequence of events that could only have come out of a movie, I started to realize I'm going to have to tell my parents because I don't. I, at that time, I was, you know, already doing interviews and things. I didn't want my father to read in the pa in the paper. Uh, and my parents came to visit me in California, where I was living. They were in New York, and I'm thinking, well, maybe I'll tell them while they're here. And they came over, and my father said, "I've got to go home. I'm seeing double." And, and I laughed because whenever my father went on a trip, he had to go home. There was always an emergency every single time. And it was always nonsense, you know. But in fact, he had his, his final illness. And so the priest uh, who I wanted to baptize me was at the Church of the In Incarnation, which is about a block away from here. And so I was coming back to New York to talk to him about baptism. And I was coming back to New York to watch my father uh, waste away. You're not talking about Father Rutler. No, no. No, wasn't Father okay. Because okay. he he's not there any, any longer. Right. Um, and basically, uh, he, he, my father died uh, on Good Monday, Thursday, I believe it was, on a week where Passover and Easter came together. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was baptized shortly after that. I never got to tell him because I didn't want to break his heart. I had broken his heart for no reason as he, as he was dying, so there was no point in telling him. But it was, a, uh, it was quite dramatic. And really, Two weeks, maybe three weeks after I was baptized, my wife turned to me and she said, "You have totally changed. You know, you have you, you are. There's a serenity you have now." That it's a, and I said, "I know. It's disgusting, but I, 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 can't, I can't help it. You know." Um, and so that you know, and, and the story the story goes on, but that's the basic. Well, it's. I mean, it's also very. It's very. I'm just fascinated by this because you, it takes you know uh, to to feel guilt over the bar mitzvah gifts and to throw them away, to be that intellectually honest is, is fascinating. Because you know, mo most people I think, you know, it's kind of why we do Socrates in the city, it's like most of us tend not to examine things that deeply. We just go whatever, you know, and, and but the fact that you had that kind of a brain that it basically forced you to deal with reality. And it, it's, just, it's just fascinating to me that as a successful writer in Hollywood, uh, that you would be willing to take this step. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, you do seem to be somebody who has that intellectual honesty, which we all ought to have, but it's just fascinating because a lot of people have had all kinds of experiences and they just, you know, ignore them. I, I have had this obsession my whole life with things making sense, that if I say something, it should make sense with other things that I think and say. When I was a little, the reason, really the reason I became a novelist is when I was a little boy, I would have fantasies like all children have. Uh, but I would say like, well, maybe I'm a superhero who can fly. And then I'd think, well, how do you get to fly? You know, how does that, how does that work? And I'd have to start to make up an entire story that made sense within the context of that. And that obsession has really served me well. I was going to say, it won you two Edgars. Uh, but it, no, but it's interesting to me because how, how different people, I remember the last time we met, we were talking about this, how everyone is created differently. We're all different. But it's just so fascinating to be able to do what you do to brilliantly plot novels and, and, and all that kind of stuff. That's a gift that I know that I don't have. It's, I'm just fascinated how that um, figures into your own life, that it has figured into your own life and led you uh, to be a man of faith. Um, you know, uh, as we've been talking about. But, okay, so to this book, um, you were talking about the conversation with your son. Now, this is your daughter here. I don't want to point her out because she'd be embarrassed, but you have, <laughs> you have children and, uh, and evidently a wonderful wife. And uh, you, you said that it was in a conversation with your son that he made this statement that maybe the problem you have with some of the hard sayings of Jesus is that you... Uh, you're trying to figure out a philosophy and you need to get to know the person, which is, I mean, it's kind of foundational. I think if you talk to anybody who's serious about their Christian faith, they say it is a relationship. Uh, it's not a series of rules or something, but a lot of people don't get that. I would, have I would have thought that at that point, you would have gotten that, but it was framed somehow differently by your son. That, that's right. It's one of those things you know, but you don't know it uh, the way you should know it. And, and my project... 
um, in, in reading, rereading the Gospels in, in Greek, five, I could only read like five sentences at a time because it took me that long to translate them. Um, but, but the project was to set every other thought aside, to set all theology, uh, all churches, even the epistles of Paul, to set them all aside and just read the Gospels to get to know the main character, the way you would read a novel, uh, you know, to get to know David Copperfield, or the way you'd read a, a biography or an autobiography, and just get that character inside myself uh, so that I could start to see what he was, what he saw. And so when did the connection come, you know, in other words, it's one thing to say I want to do that, which sounds reasonable, but then when you make this leap that you're going to use the works of England's greatest poets, Wordsworth and Shelley and Coleridge and all of these great poets of, of that era, uh, of the Romantic period, when did that come in? Because that seems genuinely crazy. Because, well, as I, as I was reading it, what would happen is I'd think like, oh, I, I see what he's saying. It's kind of like what Wordsworth said. Or I see what he's saying. It's kind of what is in the poetry of Keats. And I'm a big fan of these romantic poets, Keats and uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge. Uh, and, and I started to, at first I thought, well, okay, it didn't mean anything. It didn't uh, cohere. But then it started to occur to me that there was a very good reason for this, that the times that they lived in were so much like the times we live in now that it was almost uncanny. Uh, it was the, really the moment when God died. It was really the moment when the uh, idea that there was a supernatural meaning to life that was real vanished. And the romantics, the, people talk about the, say a lot of silly stuff about the romantics. I'm always, I'm always yelling, it's, even some of the authors who, are blurb, who blurb me, I'm always yelling at them when they say, oh, the romantics, as if they were one group of people. But a, a famous critic named Jacques Barzin said that they, they weren't one philosophy. They were just all trying to solve the same problem, which is if there is no supernatural meaning to life, is there any meaning to life? And, and where does it come from? And... And what the certain of the romantic poets, the certain of the English romantic poets did was they started to try and rebuild what they didn't realize was the Christian ethos in a relationship with nature instead of God, in a relationship between consciousness and nature instead of with God. But many of them were inspired by Coleridge, who was probably the smartest man alive then and maybe the smartest man who ever lived. And he was a, a, an absolute mess of a human being. It was an opium addict and just a hysteric and a, a, just a mess. But he was a genius, and he was the one of them who had faith. He was the one of them who believed. His faith changed over time and was sometimes offbeat and sometimes more standard, but he had faith. And he appears in the I tell the stories. I, I, this is a book for people who don't read poetry. It's not a book for people who love poetry. It's a book for uh, people who want to know about poetry. And, he, he appears, Coleridge, like a spirit again and again. So, so Wordsworth has invested all his belief in the French Revolution, and then the French Revolution turns into a nightmare, and he's lost. Wordsworth is lost, and one day he looks out the window, and there's Coleridge, who leaps over the fence and comes to his house, and the two of them then have a conversation that lasts for a year, because Coleridge never shut up. He never stopped talking. <laughs> Actually, Andrew, I just have to say that one of the things, the reason I want to reread the book is because I read it, um, I don't know, almost a year ago, whenever it came out, but I, um, there is so much in here, it is so rich, and it's, it's very embarrassing to me, you know, a Yale English major who remembers almost nothing of who these great poets were and really the intellectual tradition, because frankly, by the time I was at Yale, they almost weren't teaching this. They were kind of more into the, you know, critical theory. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with Marxism and murder, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but basically um, gi give, uh, give an overview because when you compare that period uh, to roughly the 60s until today, uh, I, I had, that had never occurred to me until I read this book that there really is a strange parallel between what was going on then uh, in the world and these the leading figures in culture and what has been going on in our lifetime. Well, th there was this revolution in France, which hard to believe now, but they thought was paradise had come to earth, you know, and just like we had this revolution in the 60s where we thought, you know, this is the age of Aquarius and nothing is going to be, after this, everything's going to be peace and love. Uh, that obviously 
as, as all of us should have known, collapsed uh, into a bloodshed both in, in the uh, Romantic period with a world war, the Napoleonic Wars were essentially a world war, and with us, it, it became the Cold War with its many wars fought in, in Vietnam, Korea, and all the, uh, that was actually before, but in, in Vietnam and all around the world, Africa and, and South America. And, and there was a conservative political reaction. We had Reagan, they had conservative uh, leadership in England, uh, but the conservative reaction couldn't keep this change of mind. There had actually been a, a change of consciousness that had taken place, and there was no way to go back, for instance, in America to the 1950s, and no way for the British to go back to the way they had been before. And so, ultimately, they were left with, how do we start to reconstruct this? And you had the rise of feminism, you had the rise of atheism, which had never even been a, a you know, the really weren't you're talking others. about, this is, uh, I mean, this goes back even before the French Revolution, but this was well, in... It, but it gets more and more right. after that. And it's a utopianist uh, scheme. And, and, and the idea that you can, if, if there is no God, if there is no supernatural morality, then why can't we just rewrite the way things are, and, and, and that they, was the and they tried. And they tried. How about a ten-day week? They actually believed they could reinvent reality, and the hubris and the naivete are kind of astonishing. And yet, we've seen it in our lifetimes, and we're seeing it again. We're now. seeing it right now. I, you know, I think I, I actually make the, the point in the book that I, I think the fall of man is like a, one of those traumas that we keep repeating. You know how when you go through a trauma in childhood, you keep doing the same stupid thing over and over again, and you can't figure out why you're doing it until you think, oh, it's just like that time this terrible thing happened to me. I'm reenacting it. Um, I really do think that the fall of man when, God, when man says to God, we will know the difference, what good and evil are. We will know. Uh, not you. We, we're going to figure that out. That I think we keep doing that. You know? Well, I, listen, that's actually, um, I, I've never thought of it that way, but the idea that it replays itself in history. I mean, the central idea, of course, is that we can be as gods. And so then we try to create a utopianist scheme to achieve heaven of our own accord. And it could be the Tower of Babel. Uh, it could be the French Revolution. It could be whatever it is. But you're right that that's what was happening uh, in, in this period, that they thought somehow we could pull this off. And, and, and in Wordsworth's uh, favorite poem, which was Paradise Lost, Wordsworth was obsessed with rewriting Paradise Lost as an interior uh, poem where heaven and hell were in the human mind and the human heart. Uh, but in Paradise Lost, Milton is trying to show that there's a difference between rebelling against a king, which he had done, he had endorsed uh, the beheading of Charles the, the I and had to run for his life after Charles II came in, and he was trying to show the, the Paradise Lost is his attempt to show the difference between that and rebelling against God, which is rebelling against goodness and creation. And, uh, and so that, that idea, well, well, how do we now rebel against kings and rebel against the church and yet not rebel against God was where Wordsworth and Coleridge kind of started without even knowing it. They didn't know they were doing this. I mean, Coleridge might have, he was so brilliant. But they wrote this book called Lyrical Ballads, which transformed English poetry. And it's a book in which they sort of say, we're going to show how the imagination in collaboration with reality transforms and enchants reality and how it brings even the smallest of people, nobility. And they basically reinvented this Christian ethos through uh, nature, through, through looking at nature, which they didn't, like I said, Coleridge knew he was doing it, but Wordsworth, I'm not sure, actually understood. Wordsworth ended his life as a Christian, but it took him a long time to come there. And they sort of passed this, this journey on to John Keats, who was the greatest English poet since Shakespeare. Uh, he lived 25 years, uh, he had about one, month, about six weeks of writing some of the greatest poetry that has ever been written and then got tuberculosis and died. And th this, this period of great creativity, I just want to say this one thing because it's so fascinating to me. He, his brother had died of tuberculosis. His poetry was getting terrible reviews. Uh, he was poor. He had a cough. He thought, he's starting to think, oh my God, I'm getting tuberculosis. He's absolutely depressed. He can't write. He's taking a walk in Hampstead Heath and he looks up and who's coming toward him? Coleridge. <laughs> and Coleridge takes him on a 40-minute walk during which Coleridge never shuts up. He just talks ceaselessly. And suddenly, this poetry comes pouring out of Keats, Ode on a Grecian Urn, Ode on a Nightingale, Ode to Autumn, the greatest poetry since Shakespeare. Uh, and then he dies. And, 
And the, the poetry is about, all, almost all of it is about, okay, there is this beautiful eternal thing out there, and here am I in this world of death and pain. How do I cross the barrier? And he tries to do it through art, through the Grecian urn, he tries to do it through the imagination, and he can't quite do it. And, and one day it just happens to him in his Ode to Autumn. Uh, he just writes this perfect poem of a, where the observer and the scene meld into one. And he doesn't know it's Christianity, but that's what it is. Uh, I wonder, I constantly wonder, what if he had lived another 25 years? What would he have seen? He understood that the soul was immortal. He understood he's the one who said beauty is truth and truth is beauty, uh, which can only make sense if that beauty is connecting us to something beyond ourselves. That's the only way that makes sense. And, uh, and, and I just don't know what would have happened to him, but uh, he didn't live, and basically the romantics fail. They kind of fade away, and this materialism that rules our lives now, where we think like, oh, you know, you feel like a man? Well, we'll cut your body into a man costume, and you'll be a man, you know? Uh, and at the same time, you'll, you say, well, I feel this is immoral. And you'll say, no, you're wrong. You know, follow the song. Well, actually, that, that's, <laughs> that's the link, right? In other words, uh, maybe I'm uh, uh, oversimplifying the, the romantics and that whole, the whole period, but what, what happened is um, feelings became paramount, so that reality becomes subjective, and whatever I feel uh, is... It. Well, it's a, weird, it's a weird binary because the idea is, the, the base, if you boil theism down to its most basic idea, it's that matter has meaning. If, if I torture a child, that's bad. It's not bad because we all agree it's bad. If everybody in the world said it was great, it would still be bad. That's the idea, that there is a, a, a supernatural, something above the nature. If that's gone, then not only do your feelings mean everything? Your feelings also mean nothing. And that's where you get this kind of confusion from the left. Yes, if you feel like a woman, I can cut up your body and you'll be a woman. But if you say, you know, cutting up someone's body and to make them a woman is wrong. So it's just your subjective feeling. That doesn't mean anything. So it's this kind of double, uh, you know, a paradox where your feelings become everything, but they are nothing. Well, that's because I mean, there's that's, no meaning to that's the problem with that thing we call reality, <laughs> right? I mean, it's kind of like it's a stack deck. Uh, God created reality, and uh, if you can convert people to reality, they will be led to Him if they're going to be intellectually, um, you know, yeah, uh, consistent. But so you, okay, so one of the things that I just loved about this book, and there's so many things, but you bring these figures to life when you describe. Uh, Coleridge and Keats and all of them. And I realized that's something that also had fallen out of fashion by the time that I was in college in the 80s, where we didn't seem to care about these figures, you know, as figures. And you sort of, uh, you, you bring them to life. So in some ways, it's, it's not a novel, but there are a lot of fun stories yeah. in this book about amazing, crazy, brilliant people trying to work these things out in their lives and in their art. Well, if you think about it, you know, Britain is an island the size of Oregon. And on it, in this one generation, or it's two generations, but it's the same time, is Coleridge, Wordsworth, Blake, Shelley, Keats, and Byron, the six greatest poets uh, in the English language besides Shakespeare and Milton, are all living together on, on this island. And so, they're all nuts because they're poets, right? They're, you know, they're, they're wild men. They're, they're falling apart half the time. Coleridge is an absolute ruin of a human being. Byron is screwing everybody, male or female, he can get his hands on. Uh, Shelley wants to be doing that, but isn't quite, you know. And, and then, and, and one of the, the people that I, I deal with is Mary Shelley. Uh, one of my favorite chapters in the book is on Frankenstein because here's Mary Shelley who adores Shelley. She adores... Uh, this man she's run off with, he's left his wife and she's run off with him. And she adored and worshipped her father and now she adores and worships Shelley. And he's basically treating her as Byron and Shelley treated all the women they came in contact with. He's basically treating her like crap, you know, and, and he believes in free love and, you know, he, he doesn't know why she's so depressed when her children die. He's depressed, you know, that he, he, she's not paying attention to him. And she writes this book, Frankenstein, where she says it's about a man who tries to steal... God's thunder by creating life. But I point out that, that we all create, people create life. We create life of the things that we have. 
What Frankenstein, what Dr. Frankenstein does is he creates life without a woman. And her nightmare is essentially the nightmare of femininity, the female aspect of life and femininity and, the, and womanhood becoming obsolete. And if you follow, they, she invents, in that moment, she invents science fiction. She really invents the modern genre of science fiction. And if you follow science fiction, so much of it is about that. Uh, you know, the, you, you get stories like my favorite example is The Terminator, uh, which is a wonderful little action movie about machines taking over the world, and there's a rebellion of humans. So what do they do? They send a guy back in time to kill the rebel leader's mother. And what's so wonderful about this movie is the mother is just a girl. Later on, she becomes this muscular superhero, but in the first movie, she's just a girl. That's, that's, that's her superpower, that she is a girl, that she is a, a feminine person, and that makes her the big threat to the machines. And I believe in this moment, this is all really coming to fruition. I, people always talk about the war against men. Conservatives are very concerned with masculinity. It's a war against women. Uh, the, the left got this right. They got the phrase right. Uh, the hostility toward women, the hostility toward the, act of, the actions the central actions of womanhood, which are, are motherhood and nurturing and family building and humanity creation. Uh, it's not just the creation of humanity physically, but as I point out in the book, the, the science, as we call it, uh, now shows that, that mothers create people spiritually as well, that, that there's no difference between a baby and the mother until the mother gives that baby individuality. And so, uh, this, this, this battle that we're in, and I think you know this and talk about this a lot, uh, it is a spiritual battle, and these guys were at the very forefront of it. And the reason I think it's so important to go back to them is because we lost the wisdom that they had. We lost the tools with which to build the road back to a Christianity for the modern world. Because Christ never changes, but we change, and our language changes, and our ideas and metaphors change. And I think they gave us this path uh, both these three poets and, and Mary Shelley, uh, that it describe the battle we're in. Well, again, it's one of the reasons that I love the book because uh, a, a lot of times um, I think the reason uh, Christian faith in modern uh, context can be off-putting is because a lot of its proponents tend to be religious in the negative sense. In other words, they're very stuck on theology or they love talking about biblical times, but they don't allow it to, um, they, they, they're, they're not really helping translate it into the rest of reality, all of reality. And that's kind of what you're talking about. Like we're, we're you know, whatever generation we live in, we have the same project to make meaning of life, to ask, does life have meaning? What is meaning? Why do I think it might have meaning? Why does the world tell me, don't worry about that, we figured it out, it doesn't have meaning, it's just you know, a concatenation of atoms and things. And then, do it. And then, and, but nobody's really buying that. No one actually buys that life is meaningless. But we try in our kind of broken ways to, to put something together. And your thesis, and I obviously agree with it, is that the God of the Bible is the roadmap to all of those things. So it's kind of fascinating that no matter, even when you're kicking against it, you're, you, again, you're, you're dealing with this thing called reality. And so eventually you have to find your way back and it happens over and over. But um, so when you talk about how the, these poets that you've mentioned uh, uh, helped you understand some of the sayings or the, 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 the more difficult sayings of Jesus, give us uh, some examples of that. Well. Now you're looking at a man who says to you, uh, if you, you, if no man has seen the Father, but if you've seen me, you see the Father. That is the ultimate expression of meaning in life. That is the ultimate expression of somebody saying, you know, here is a man who represents what is more than a man, which is, I think, true in a much, much lesser extent of all of us. We all are, represent meaning. Every action we take has a moral meaning. Everything we do has not just a moral meaning, but has a spiritual meaning. I'd go beyond that. And what Jesus is saying is my life is the meaning of life. My story is, you know, he is the word. He is the word, and the word has a meaning. The body is a word, I believe, and the body has a meaning. Uh, it's when, when people think about the soul, they think about this, you know, little Casper, the ghost inside you, but but no, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, what it is is that as, as we represent 
good by doing good, and as we represent evil by doing evil, we represent Andrew by being Andrew, and we represent John and Jane by being John and Jane, and in doing that, you are actually uh, rep uh, the word that speaks the soul. Jesus is the word that speaks the big soul, you know, the, the, the king's soul, and, and when you start to read him like that, you understand that he's trying to, he's not, you know, Jesus isn't telling you what to do, he's telling you how to, how to be, he's telling you how to see, and that is, the, that's the remarkable thing, the line that kept leaping out at me uh, as I was writing the book was Jesus saying, I'm telling you these things so that the joy that is in me will be in you. Now think to yourself, how many Christians you know represent that? Um, but it is the story of my conversion. Um, as I you know, frequently say, that the joy I experience is disgusting. I, I, this, one of our favorite movies is A Christmas Carol with Alistair Sim, and at the end of The Christmas Carol, when he's been redeemed, he says, I don't deserve to be so happy, but I can't help it. And, and, I, think that, and I think that that is, is what Jesus is actually getting at. When you start to see, you know, one of the words that puzzled me that I started the book with was love your enemy. Like, I don't even like my enemies. So, so I thought, well, what does that mean? Should I like my enemies? Most of my enemies are, you know, I don't have that many enemies. The ones I have, like, are really enemies, you know. So. <laughs> but then, but Jesus explains it. He says, love your enemies so that you will be like your Father in heaven who brings the sun and the rain on the good and the bad alike. And you thought, think, if I saw the world like that, what a burden would be taken off my shoulders. What a burden of judgment, what a burden of control, what a burden of hatred and, and separation. You know the thing that I say on my, on my podcast that gets the most angry letters was that Jesus really did tell you not to judge. And Christians write to me, no, that's not what he, he, that's not what he meant. You know, so, so he said, judge not, but that's not what he meant. No, you know. <laughs> 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 and, they, and they say, well, well, he meant don't judge hypocritically. And I said, like, so the king of the universe came to earth as man, suffered death, and was buried to tell us not to judge hypocritically? I, I knew that, you know? I mean, he could have phoned, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, I mean, this, this thing that he's telling you to let go of, to, he, the way he's telling you to blow the hinges off the doors of your heart, uh, is so radical that even when you realize that's what he's saying, you can't realize it. Now, I want to give you a little pushback on uh -oh. this. Because this is so heavy, and it's, because it's very easy to say, but don't, don't judge, don't judge. Just like you said, it's easy to say, you know, love your enemies. And a lot of people go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you say this in the beginning of the book, it could just be blather. In other words, you want to know, wait, wait a minute, what do you mean by that, right? So to love your enemy, you know, uh, people that think they're holier than Jesus, like, you know, Joan Baez at some point said something like, like, I'd like to think I don't have enemies, you know? And you think like, yeah, Jesus was, was such a petty jerk that he had enemies, but you, Joan Baez, you know, because you're part of the, 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 the Woodstock generation, you don't have enemies. And the point is, no, you have enemies. So he doesn't say you won't have enemies, but love your enemies. So if someone is trying to kill you or trying to harm you, you God wants us to have the eternal perspective that says that guy who is trying to kill you or whatever, I died for him and I love him. And so uh, if he were your wayward son, maybe you, you would have some sympathy for him that you wouldn't if, if he's just somebody or whatever. But, but in other words, to find that place where you could see that I'm broken too, and I'm capable of, of, of bad things. So, you know, when you say that, but when you say judge not, right, I mean, it, I assume that he means that you're still judging between good and evil. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I think that's what gets people upset. Uh, actually, what I think gets people upset is that they want to judge, that they, they don't want to let go of that. It's you know, fun. That, it's fun. It's fun to judge. <laughs> it's, and it's easy too. And it's it's very easy. easy. Um, but, but of course you have to judge crimes. You know, there's a difference between a crime and a sin. You know, there are, uh, you can say, oh, that's a bad thing to do, you know. Um, but what you can't judge is a person's, a, a soul's position in relationship to God. I mean, one of, one of the, the, the gifts of coming to faith so late is there are many things that uh, Christians are very concerned with that don't concern me at all. The end of days. 
Like, I'm, I'm absolutely certain God has got the end of days locked up, you know. That, <laughs> that he, he's not going to call. I don't have to turn the lights out. You know, I don't have, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like, I, I, and people say, is this the end of days? And I say, I don't know. It actually says in the Bible, you don't know. He just said, Jesus said, Jesus says, I don't know, you know. <laughs> so I, I take it you're not breeding a red heifer. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's I'm, a, I'm stacking the canned goods. Yeah. Side, you know. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not really interested in the fact that people do incredibly destructive, self-destructive things. I mean, I'm interested in it. If they ask me, should I do this thing? I will say no with the full knowledge that they're not going to listen to me. <laughs> they're going to keep doing that thing. Uh, but, but I get it. You know, I get it. It's, it's hard to be a human being. And, and sometimes, you know, it, it's a great comfort to drink yourself to death. You know, it's like... Um, and so I'm not, I, I don't hate people for that stuff, you know? I mean, I, I, Well, I, I think what you're trying to say, uh, if I'm understanding you right, is that you lived in what Christians call the world for a long time. And so you, you kind of get that. I mean, I have a little bit of that in the sense, too, that I mean, I remember what it was to think people who were serious Christians had to be idiots or had to be, like, I remember those emotions. And so today, when I see people who, maybe think that of me, it doesn't bother me because I remember why they felt that way or they live in a world where there's almost no other options but to think that thought and maybe to keep themselves safe, they have to dismiss you or, or, or something like that. Or when, I, when I wrote The Great Good Thing, my memoir, uh, it, it was a, a joke how often God was obviously standing at my shoulder slapping me upside the head going, you know, schmuck, you know, pay attention. <laughs> and, and it was all on the page. And I, I, even as I was writing the book, I didn't know it. And when I reread the book to edit it, I thought, oh, look, I, oh I'm the idiot. You know, I, I'm, you know. And, and so once you see that, you know, kind of, you loosen up a little bit. Did you hear the audible word schmuck? <laughs> yeah, yes, that audible that that impression. I, I still, I'm hearing it now, actually. It's, uh, <laughs> but so you, mean, I, so you mean partially in a sense that some people uh, of faith can, come, can, can become obsessed with sin and trying to wipe out sin. And you're saying that, it, that that's, it doesn't bother you in that way. You see it differently. I think they get obsessed with everything, but the question that they're trying to avoid is who am I supposed to be? Who was I made to be? What did God have in mind when he made me? There is not a single person on the planet Earth, there really is not, who does not know for certain he is not the person he was made to be. Every single person knows this. Every single person. You know, I always make this joke on my show when I say, this will change your life. Will it change your life for the better? I don't know. Because, <laughs> because, because when you say to somebody, read this book, it will change your life, nobody ever asks. They, you know, you can go, you can go up to, to, to Tom Cruise, like this rich movie star, say, read this book, it'll change your life. Oh, good, you know, that's, that's what I need. You think, like, why does Tom Cruise right, need to right, change his life? Right. But every single person knows he is not the person he's supposed to be, and that's why he gets obsessed with what you're doing. Because if with he, what someone else is with, doing. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I think that it's just the easier thing to think about. And, I, and by the way, I'm not holding myself up as an example. I'm doing the same thing. It's just that you remember you pull yourself back into finding, you know, you know the, the word that's translated as sin in both the Greek and the Hebrew means missing the target. Uh, and, and when Jesus says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is, you know, because when you read that, you think like, oh boy, you know, no, that's not, it can't mean what it means. It, it, the word he's using is hit your goal, hit your end point, hit the purpose of yourself, you know? And so it, sin, we think of sin as like you're a naughty guy, you're a bad guy, but it's really, you're, you're missing the target, and the only target you have is you, you know? And, and I think that all the things that Jesus says are ways of getting you back there, you know? It's not like do this and you'll be a good guy and you'll go to heaven, do this and you get brownie points, do this and you get a Christmas present, it's do this and you will get the joy that is in him. Joy, I mean, that really is at the heart of it. Earlier I mentioned hope. Uh, it's so fascinating that you can meet people who are, um, they're very knowledgeable uh, about the Bible or religion, but they don't have joy. Uh, a lot of them don't have hope either, which is uh, kind of a double bummer. And, uh, but it's a fascinating thing because I think there's something, you know, it's like when Hemingway talked about the BS detector, that you, you we all know, whether we know anything about 
any kind of faith, because we're human beings creating God's image, we all have an innate sense that we, would, we know a few things. For example, we, we, we know what is appealing to us, or we, we know what strikes us as perhaps closer to the center of truth, if there is such a thing. We, we have an innate sense of that. So if you meet someone who is religious in the negative sense that we're kind of talking about, somebody who's obsessed with don't do this, do this, don't do this, or they, you kind of think, well, whatever, I'm not looking for that. Right. Like, whatever you're selling, I don't want that because you seem joyless or you seem peevish. And, and, and it is no coincidence, I assume, that when you start to live into that joy, and by joy I don't mean happiness, by the way, I don't mean that sm yellow smiley face thing, that, you know, what I, what I mean is the, the presence in life, being present in life with this vitality. So I, I compare it a lot of times to going to a movie where there's a sad scene and you're crying and you're crying and you walk out and someone says, how was the movie? It was great, you know? And, 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 like, and so, and so you, you know, I'm joy is, is living like that, is living as if, oh, you know, this is, this this is the thing that is, is going on, and, it, and it's, it's superb, it's marvelous. Um, and, and I think that, that when that joy is lacking, you have nothing to sell, <laughs> you know? And when it's there, uh, you do. But oh, what I was going to say is that it's no coincidence is that as that joy blossoms in you, you stop doing a lot of the stuff you were doing, you know? You, you stop. Okay, see that to me, I mean, I've, I've written about this and talked about it a lot. And it was in the, I think it was in the course of writing my Bonhoeffer biography that it hit me that uh, you know you, you have two kinds of uh, religious people, let's say, right? One group thinks that the goal of life is to avoid sin. Uh, and the other group says the goal of life is to live in response to God's goodness. And, and, and when you're living in that kind of gratitude to God, you end up avoiding sin, but you're not focused on avoiding sin because uh, one is inherently negative and one posits God as, as a, a dour uh, judge, in, in a sense, and the other one posits God as a loving father. And, and if, you, if you get it wrong, you're sort of worshiping the devil by thinking, and you think it's God, and you think I better not do this, better not do this, better do this, better do that, and you're miserable. That's kind of what happened to Luther on some level. It's like <laughs> yeah, he's the, you know, you yeah. think I'm gonna, I'm gonna get everything right, I'm gonna do everything right, and you never become more miserable than when you're trying to do that. I notice I'm, I'm agreeing with you about Luther, but I only know this because I read your book. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, but, but yeah, no, I, I think that that's exactly right. I mean, you know, it's funny, we had, we, at the Daily Wire, we do these things called backstage where all the hosts get together and sort of have a discussion. And we got into a discussion about pornography. And one of the Catholic hosts was saying, you must never look at pornography. It's like committing uh, adultery. It's the same as committing adultery and all these things. And one of the other guys said, look, guys look at pornography. You know, guys look at this stuff. And, and I said, you know, I, I agree with the second guy, the guys do look at this, and I would say that I'm a person who would look at, you know, maybe not pornography, but nudity and th things that men find exciting, uh, that hit the eyes exciting. And then one day I just didn't anymore, you know? And it wasn't like I said, you know, I've got to, I've got to stop. It's just too much joy. <laughs> There's too much joy to get that in, to throw that into the mix, you know? Um, and, and that's, I think, more... You know, whenever Jesus talks about the moral rules, he almost throws it away, you know? Go and sin no more, or sort of like, well, what do I do? Well, do this, but, but the real thing is love God and love your neighbor, you know? Then he gets down to the... Well, that's neighbor. the whole thing, is if, if you're in love with God and you experience that, it's so wonderful that you don't want any of that other stuff. And that's yeah. really, the, that's the magic, yeah. right? And it is so the magic, yes. And so if uh, D David Wilkerson, who was a pastor here uh, in New York City, uh, I think he once called it, he said it's, it's, the, it's the pork chop philosophy of evangelism, that if you, you, you know, if you, if a dog's got a bone uh, and you want it to drop the bone, you know, you offer it a pork chop, you know, <laughs> uh, and it'll drop that bone just like that. Yeah, it'll yeah. prefer the pork chop. And I kind of feel like that's what God is supposed to be. It's like when you find God, you suddenly realize the the incredible emptiness of all these other things that you've been hoping might somehow assuage your pain, which we all have. Um, well, that about sums it up. Um, I want to ask you uh, 
again, the, the thesis, when you say uh, the deeper understanding of the words of Jesus, give us another example, if you can think of one, of how some of these poets helped you understand some saying of, of Jesus's, because I'm fascinated with this idea. Well, again, I think that when I looked at the, um, the, the Sermon on the Mount as a, a as a, a kind of a prediction, like, you know, blessed are those who weep because they will be comforted. You know, and you think like, well, that's kind of like, it, so, it sounds like he's saying, don't worry if you're miserable now because when you die and, and go to heaven, everything will be great. That's kind of the way it gets interpreted. Um, but it actually is, I, I think, a, a profound understanding of the difference between uh, time and, and eternity. And I think that that's what the poetry of Keats is all about. It's all about how do I get from this prison of time uh, into the expanse of eternity. And, and the wonderful thing about this, when you realize it, is you realize, no, this, that's, that's what the suffering is. The suffering, suffering is that it happens in time, but not necessarily in eternity. And all of the kind of Karamazov, you know, Dostoevsky ideas of like, how can, how can suffering ever be redeemed? You start to think, well, actually, you know, it actually can, once you start to understand the prison of time. The, pr the time, time is one of the most uh, profound things to understand in, in what Jesus is saying, because he sees eternity, and we don't. And you very frequently hear his voice, why don't you see this? You know, how, what is wrong with the, you know, he says, what's wrong with this generation, as if some other generation, you know, had been, had really been into this, you know, but no, you know, <laughs> it's like, he, he almost can't understand what we don't see, and what we don't see is eternity. And so th that, I think, was, um, was what the, the Romantics did start to understand. I don't talk about William Blake much in the, in the book, but he's the one who said, you know, to, to see eternity, uh, what was it, to see eternity in the, hold eternity in the palm of your hand, is that what it is? Uh, to see the world in a grain of sand and hold eternity in the palm of your hand. And, and that's what they're all kind of looking for, all the best of them uh, are looking for. And so when you start to see that, that Jesus is showing you something, he's not, he's not lecturing you, he's not like you know, scolding you, he's not uh, giving you a rule book, he's simply saying, this is what I see, you can see this, you can see this, that your tears are at all, it's not that blessed are those who cry, they will be comforted, your tears are already gone, your tears are already wiped away, and you just don't know it yet, you know, because you're in, in time. You, the funny thing is, you really can see the world like this. Uh, you, you know, I was trying to describe this to my wife the other day. We were taking a hike, and I suddenly I saw an ant on a rock, and I suddenly saw the infinite distance between the ant and the rock. Something that happened to me when my, my daughter was born, which was the only mystical experience of my life, when I saw all this matter, you know, all this blood and urine and crap, and then this child, you know. And, and I was trying to describe to my wife the, the difference between the ant and the rock and how amazing it was. She turned to me and she said, you sound like you're five years old. <laughs> and I thought- Or, or well, wasted. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I thought, well, good, good. good. You know, like if you can become like a little child, you're actually doing okay. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. Well, but it, it is interesting because you, you know, we're talking about ineffable things and yet the Lord wants us to talk about those things. When we're talking about, you know, when yeah. you're talking about reality and you, 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 when you start realizing that, I mean, C.S. Lewis to me is the greatest at this in a sense where he, I don't know where he says it, but you know, the reason we're uncomfortable in time is because God did not make us for time. He made us for eternity. And eternity, most people think that means a long time. No, that's, the, that's <laughs> eternity yeah. is outside of time and space, and we are meant for that world, and we are fundamentally uncomfortable in the medium of time. And he wants us to transcend time. In other words, we can already partake of eternity now while we're still here, not fully. But you know, uh, it, it, sounds like a, it sounds like a bad Herman Hess novel or something like that, but it, it really is um, oftentimes we don't approach faith that way, that it, it, it's, it, it, it's beautiful, it makes sense, it's for everyone, it's not just for religious people, right? And I think that's one of the things I um, appreciate so much about this book. Uh, now, which of the poets that you mentioned were 
Christians, which were, were, had actual faith, weren't just nominally Christians. Well, as I say, the, the one who was a Christian really throughout his life was, was Coleridge, and he has the great line where he says, he says, Jesus Christ, I believe the word is sensorum, a word I've never heard before and have never heard since anywhere else, but Coleridge uses it, meaning that he is the, he is the model of how we experience life. Not the model of what we do, not the moral model, but the model of how we are to receive life, the sensorum. And that vision, I think, informs all the people that he talks to. He even, you know, he even talks to Mary Shelley when she's a little girl. He comes over to her house and reads uh, the, um, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. So each one of them he touches in his way. So he's the kind of spirit through the whole thing. But Wordsworth becomes a Christian, and Wordsworth has, in many ways, a very, very difficult life. He has a wonderful marriage, but his children, many of his children die, including his, his uh, beloved daughter uh, when she's very little. And um, uh, C.S. Lewis gets the, the uh, title, Surprised by Joy, from his Wordsworth's poem uh, about his, his daughter uh, passing away. And, and so he goes through a lot of stuff, but ultimately becomes a Christian himself. And as I say with Keats, uh, you don't know what he would have become. Uh, Shelley is a radical, and Byron are radicals, and they live and die atheists. Uh, but Mary Shelley is interesting. She's, she's in with the radicals, and then they die, and she holds up the flame of Shelley her whole life. She never marries again. But she grows into an old Victorian lady, and her books become very feminine, very... Uh, um, they hold up the feminine. They hold up the, the domestic life of, of the world, and they hold up what was then the evangelical idea of, of God, because that's when the evangelicals had their rise uh, in another one of your damn books you're always writing that, about William <laughs> Wilberforce. Um, but, but no, it was, that, that's what replaces, that's why I have some hope for our time, because what replaces uh, the Romantic period is the Victorian period, which I think is one of the high watermarks of human history. Um, some people disagree with me. But Except I, for the furniture. <laughs> that's just my opinion. Oh, come on. Just my opinion. Um, <laughs> We, um, we're just about out of time. I'm always astonished uh, at how quickly this goes. Uh, I'm thrilled you've read my books, but I'm also a little frightened, a little frightened to think of you uh, reading my books uh, because of your fine mind. What, what have we not touched on, do you think, uh, I, I, in this book? I think book? the thing that, that you, you hit upon glancingly is really the central idea is that that what these poets rediscovered without really meaning to was that the world of enchantment, the world of angels and demons and heaven and hell and God uh, are not a magical world. They are actually this world that we're in. And they, this is a world uh, as, as Madonna, not the Madonna, but Madonna tells us this is a material world. Everything that happens in it is material. There is no, uh, there's no action without material action. And yet, and yet, every single thing that we know has a meaning uh, above itself, a, super, a literally supernatural meaning. And, and so it's not a world of magic. The paintings that have been painted of it uh, are just what, uh, small attempts to communicate it. But it's your life. It's your life that's going on right now and, and our lives, all of our lives. And when you start to see that, uh, every move you make suddenly takes on a new aura, a new, a new spiritual glow, and your life just gets better. <laughs> and, that's, and that's, I think, the thing that they were kind of pointing the way back to. And we have left them behind. We've forgotten them. But they were right. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Clavin. Yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Love talking to you.